Hello, my name is Kevin Frost, and I'm an HVAC engineer at Slipstream. In this short video, I'm going to be covering the basics of HVAC controls, control loops, and sequences. We'll be covering a lot in this video. We'll be covering open and closed control loops, control response, control loop tuning, and control sequences of operation. But first, I have to ask, why do we need HVAC controls in the first place? Well, if we didn't have HVAC controls, all of our HVAC equipment would be operating at full load all the time. By putting in automatic DDC controls, we can now modulate our equipment for part load. This is good because it saves energy and does a better job at maintaining occupant comfort and throughout the building. We can also use the HVAC controls to protect equipment, prevent faults and failures, and help inform maintenance staff when HVAC equipment might not be working correctly. In the previous webinar, we should have learned about the basic components of a control system, the sensor, the controller, and the control device. These three components form a control loop, which works to affect the process to help us get to the conditions that we want for the building or whatever process we're trying to affect. That loop will repeat over time and ideally we'll get to the values that we want it to be at. Throughout this video, we'll be using some terminology that is important to understand. The first term that we need to know is the controlled variable. The controlled variable is the variable we want to control. Uh, an example would be a home thermostat we're trying to control space temperature. So con the controlled variable is space temperature. What we set our thermostat to is called the set point. This is the desired value that we want for the controlled variable. What the temperature in, this, in your house actually is, is the control point. This is the actual value of the controlled variable at a given time. And the difference between the temperature of your house and the temperature you want it to be is called the offset or the error. The terms are interchangeable. All it is is the difference between the control point and the set point. Let's go through an example to help better define those terms. Here we have a hot water coil that's heating a room. The temperature sensor detects that the space is at 68 degrees. In this case, because the heating coil is heating the room, our controlled variable is space temperature. And 68 degrees is the current control point. That sensor sends an input signal to the controller. The controller will co then compare it to its set point. Right now it's set at 70 degrees. The difference between what the sensor is reading and what the controller is set at is the offset or what's also called the error. So there's a two degree error in this system. And the controller is programmed to react if there's a two degree error and sends an output to the hot water valve to open, which allows hot water to flow to the heating coil and it starts heating the space. And eventually the space will get to 70 degrees. There's two main types of control loops. There's an open loop and a closed loop. In an open loop, the sensor is measuring something other than the controlled variable. In a closed loop, the sensor is measuring the controlled variable directly. We can actually combine these and make a loop called a closed loop with reset. And this is where the closed loop set point is reset based on another sensor. Let's go through some examples and then these will make more sense. This is an example of open loop control. In open loop control, You'll notice that we're heating a space with that hot water heat exchanger, but the temperature sensor has been moved outside of the building. It's measuring the outdoor temperature. It's not directly me measuring what's the, uh, our control variable, which is indoor space temperature. Really, we want the indoor space to be warm, not the outside. Um, so this is an open loop. It has its place, but it's not usually recommended because you're not directly measuring the variable. So we don't recommend this type of control. What's kind of obvious in this case is the closed loop control, where you move the temperature sensor back inside the space. The sensor is directly affected by the action of the controlled device. That is, when the hot water valve opens and the hot water coil is heating the space, uh, we can measure 
if it's actually heating it or not. This is good because we get some feedback on whether our control loop is working. However, let's say it's 65 or 70 degrees outside and the space is only a couple degrees below set point. Maybe we don't really want to run our heater in that scenario because it's so warm outside. Well, we can actually add an open loop to our closed loop system and this is closed loop with reset. Now you'll notice that we have two sensors, one inside, which is our closed loop and one outside, which is our open loop. And that outdoor temperature sensor is going to reset our space temperature set point to be a bit warmer when it's hot outside. We're gonna have a future webinar discussing on how we can use this reset strategy to save energy at different points in our building. The next section of the video will cover control action and response. This is how our controllers are set to react to changes in the controlled variable and how quickly they respond to get them up to set point. We'll be going through two position control, floating control, and modulating control. In fact, we'll be going over two types of modulating control, proportional control and proportional integral control. But first, we like to cover perfect control. This is the ideal scenario on how we want to control our system. We have our controlled variable. Let's pretend it's space temperature. Um, and ideally, when our space temperature is so much lower than our set point, we would like to heat the space very quickly, get to our set point, and just have it stay there. Unfortunately, this isn't very realistic. It's very difficult to do with our sensors, controllers, and control devices. Um, but ideally, this is what we want to accomplish. Here's two position control. This is a more realistic type of control sequence that maybe you'd see um, with an on-off device. Here you can see the control point fluctuates much more. But you also notice there's a set point and we have a second line above that set point. That line represents the control differential. Um, the, if we had no control differential and just the set point, you'll notice in our example that we would be turning on and off our equipment much more frequently. Let's go through the example and this might make more sense. Again, let's pretend we have space temperature and we're controlling a space heater. As temperature drops and it crosses set point, we'll turn on the heater. Our controller will send the signal, turn the heater on. Temperature will stop going down as fast and eventually we'll start heating the space and the space will start warming up. When we hit set point again, we actually ride through set point and we let the space just keep getting warmer until the temperature matches our control differential. When we hit that line, now we turn the heater off. The space will st stop warming up and it'll eventually start cooling down like it was before. Again, we'll ride through our control differential until we hit our set point where we'll turn it on. And from there, the cycle will repeat. You'll notice that our control, our control, uh, our control variable has peaks and valleys much wider than our control differential as shown with these green lines. This is called the operating differential. And this is truly what your, in, in our example, space temperature would be fluctuating be between during our control cycle. Um, if our set point was 70 and our control differential was 72, maybe we'd be have an operating differential from 69 to 73. If our control differential is too wide, that operating differential will get wider and occupants might not be as comfortable as the space keeps fluctuating between such drastically different temperatures. But if we made our control differential too small, we would be turning on and off our equipment much more frequently, which will lead to continued wear and perhaps require an early replacement for that heater. This is floating control, and you'll notice it's a bit different than the two position control, but it's actually also a binary sequence. Again, we have our set point and a control differential, but 
But this time, let's in our example, let's use a hot water valve for a hot water heat exchanger. So as temperature drops and we cross our set point again, our control system will start opening that hot water valve. And the valve will continue to open until we start warming the space. When we cross set point again, instead of writing through, we'll actually send a command to stop opening. This doesn't close the valve. It just leaves the valve where it's at. The idea is hopefully we'll find some balance this way and that our control point will stay within our control differential for a longer amount of time. Eventually, let's say some sun starts shining through the window and the space starts getting warmer, we'll hit our control differential. Oh, and we'll be floating in between our control differential until we get to our control differential again, in which case we start closing the valve as we've gone beyond the bounds of what we find acceptable. Uh, eventually, the space temperature will start dropping back into our control differential range. And when we cross the control differential, we'll stop closing. Let's stop for a second. And imagine you're trying to drive a car with this on-off control sequence. You would either be on the accelerator all of the time or completely off the accelerator. It'd be incredibly difficult to maintain a constant speed. When we drive, we're actually making constant adjustments uh, based on how different our speed is from the speed that we want to be driving at. What our foot's really doing is when we're, say, 20 miles per hour away from the speed we want, we might slam on the accelerator. But as we get closer to the speed we want, we start to back off. And, and as we're only a couple miles per hour different, we might only be pushing on that accelerator a little bit. This is modulating control. And we try to simulate this in HVAC controls with a, an equation for proportional control. You'll notice in this equation, there's a KP term and an E term. The E term is the error, which we defined earlier as uh, the difference between the set point, in our example, the speed we want to go, and what our current speed actually is, which is our control point. We'll multiply that by a constant, but the idea is that the bigger the difference is, the harder we want our control system to react, and the smaller the difference is, we want it to, the control system to react less. This is what that looks like. Again, error or E in our equation is just the difference between the control point and the set point. In this case, as, uh, as our control variable goes above set point, the bigger the difference, the more this control system is gonna react. But eventually, as that difference gets smaller, it reacts less and less, and we start to hold a more stable position. Unfortunately, in proportional control, that stable position is still not at our set point, but it is consistent. We call that consist. We call the difference between the set point and where we kind of end up at our permanent bias. And every proportional control response will have permanent bias. The difference is we, we've achieved something we couldn't with two position and floating control, which is a stable control point. To remove this permanent bias, we can add another term to our equation. And we call this proportional integral control. This integral term that we add should remove the permanent bias and it looks a little more like this. Um, again, at the beginning, there's some more fluctuations to try to get the error under control, but eventually it gets closer and closer until it, until it matches. So this removes permanent bias, and, and when it comes to modulating control response, this is usually what we use in HVAC. Um, it should be noted that we can actually add a third term to the equation for a derivative control, and that's called PID proportional integral derivative, or 
PID loop control. PID loop control is more common in industrial applications where you need a lot of fast response. We've HVAC and control engineers have found it's not really necessary in HVAC control systems to respond that quickly. Most of our systems actually prefer slow and stable responses um, for to keep our environment uh, more stable. What's important in any of these sequences is that you tune your control loops. We'll adjust the control parameters. In modulating control, we're adjusting KP and KI, which are the coefficients that we multiply the error by. And in, uh, in on-off control, you're adjusting your control differential to achieve the best quick, stable control response. Uh, what these parameters need to be will vary vastly depending on the control applications. And tuning them is not an easy task and is usually done by your control contractor or a third party commissioning agent. However, it greatly affects the operation of your control system. If your loop is out of tune and you're only using a proportional loop, you might end up with a permanent bias that's significantly different than your set point. And again, with proportional control, uh, no matter how well you can tune KP, there'll always be some bias, but at least you can get closer to what your set point is. The opposite of this uh, may actually be worse where your loop ends up pretty much oscillating and unstable as the equipment is constantly hunting for the set point. Uh, like an example of this would be a valve actuator that's constantly opening and closing, opening and closing to the point that it almost mirrors two position control to try to meet set point. In this case, not only is are your occupants not gonna be comfortable, but you're gonna wear out your equipment, you're gonna use more energy, and uh, other parts of your system won't be able to maintain stable control either because, because this one part that just keeps changing constantly. It's very important that you tune your loop and you get stable control that looks something like this, where eventually you get to your set point or very close to it. In this last part of the presentation, we're gonna talk about control sequences of operations. Um, the sequences of operations are the instructions or the program that tells the controllers how to operate control devices. Uh, a lot of these are a lot of basic sequences are already in the specifications for the Department of Defense. UFGS 230993 has some default sequences to use based on your system. And the HVAC engineer or, or designer needs to properly uh, instruct the controls contractor on how to operate the equipment and how to program their controllers. Here's an example of what's in that UFGS uh, specification. We won't go through exactly what it is, but you'll see it's a very it's a text document that tells um, that tells the controller exactly what to do based on what the sensor is reading. Eventually, the controls contractor will program it. Um, this is a block diagram, which is a visual representation of what that program looks like. Um, but hopefully, this should be in your building automation system and accessible at your web interface. And with that, I conclude the video. Uh, thank you for your participation.